Canadian Cooperative Association, also program coordinator for the Measuring the Cooperative Difference Research Network. So we're very pleased to be able to host this panel today, where we have um, four projects within our network that will be presented. And so I want to introduce our first, we're going to rearrange the order a bit to keep things spiking. So, and also could be in this chat somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got Judith Lift, who's who starting today with the presentation here, the Emergence of Renewable Energy Cooperatives in Canada, examining the slow pace of change. And so Judith is the Executive Director for the Toronto Renewable Energy Cooperative, and also Interim Chair of the Cooperative Network for Community Power in Ontario. So let's have a warm welcome for Judith. initiative that the Social Sciences Command of the Research Council of Canada is supporting. It's a five-year study looking at how the cooperative sector and how it distinguishes, distinguishes itself from uh, other forms of enterprise. Uh, so myself and J.J. McMurtry are working together on uh, looking at the renewable energy co-op sector, which is a new emerging form of cooperative in Canada. It's uh, fairly well established in other parts of the world, principally in in European countries, um, and I guess uh, you know what's interesting about the Cura and why myself as a practitioner really you know is, is pleased to be a part of it is it's an opportunity for us as practitioners to do research and that's not often easy to do. We tend to get pretty um, bogged down in the day-to-day -day, um, practical elements of, of developing co-ops. Uh, so this is a unique opportunity to use students a fair bit to help address some research questions. Uh, and that's ultimately what's been happening with this, with this project. Um, we've really been looking at how the renewable energy co-op sector is emerging in different parts of the world. Um, what are the key barriers to their implementation here in Canada? Um, there's particular emphasis on Ontario because of the policy framework that we have in the province of Ontario that is enabling was meant to enable community uh, renewable energy cooperatives. Uh, and then we're using essentially that the line to help further the sector to uh, share resources to influence policy. So those are ultimately the objectives of the of the project. It's, it's we're part of the we're working on this for three years. Um, so the partnership is with, is with York University. And uh, we're into our we finished our second year, so I'm starting our third year now. Can everybody hear me? Uh, very quickly about uh, TREC, so uh, it used to stand for Toronto Renewable Energy Cooperative. Um, we sort of changed the T to TREC, which is a little circular, I understand that. Um, but it's basically because of, uh, some of our new projects are not based in Toronto, and also because of the work we do in fact province-wide. Uh, so we're still, you know, small organization, not a lot of resources. Rebranding is not, uh, unfortunately, something that we can afford to do right now, so we are trying to make do with the name. Um, so TREC was established in 1998 for the purpose of developing community-owned renewable energy projects. The uh, directors at the time were very interested in the co-op model as a form of ownership, um, looking at uh, and sort of being inspired by what was happening in Denmark and Germany around this. Uh, they built their first, uh, the, the first cooperatively-owned wind project in Canada and was completed in 2002 as a joint venture with Toronto Hydro. It's a uh, 600 kilowatt wind turbine in, the, in downtown Toronto. So very visible, highly visible project. Uh, successful on many levels, financially not so much. Um, in uh, 2000, last year we launched SolarShare, which is the uh, first renewable energy co-op in Ontario under new rules that were introduced under uh, the Green Energy Act and the Feed and Tariff Program. This is a, a policy framework that enables uh, individuals or groups that are uh, generating power to feed into the grid and get paid uh, a price per kilowatt hour of their generation. So it's a very particular framework. It's it's proven now around the world that it's really the most uh, effective way of enabling uh, a diverse set of technologies to participate in the electricity sector. Uh, and it's particularly um, effective for community organizations because it means you're not competing on price with large developers. 
Uh, I'm not going to get into the policy a lot, but I can certainly talk to anybody who's interested in knowing more about that. Um, you know, what the implications are um, around policy for renewable energy product development. Uh, TREC is a, a leader in sustainable energy education. We launched a charitable foundation uh, two years ago. We educate about 20,000 children around Ontario uh, in renewable energy technology and do that tying into the curriculum. And we're also working on capacity building tools, sharing our learning with other groups um, that may be, um, you know, still, still, still sort of figuring things out. And then because we have projects in the ground, we can use that to inform policy. So that's TREK in a nutshell. Um, there's a lot going on. There's about 10 people that work at TREK full time, and we have a very committed uh, and engaged board of directors. Many of whom have been, or several who have been around since the inception of TREK. So uh, very long, long lifespan, if you will. Um, so very quickly, um, renewal, when we talk about renewable energy co-ops, uh, I mean there are different forms. In my case, in this presentation, I'm talking specifically about renewable energy projects that generate electricity and feed electricity into the grid. There are also other forms of renewable energy co-ops that are producing uh, biogas, biofuels um, for, for heating purposes or for uh, motor fuels. Um, everything that I'm talking about is specific to electricity generation uh, and distribution. And what's interesting about renewable energy co-ops and, and part of the challenge that we have in Ontario around renewable energy co-ops is, is that they're really an investment vehicle. Um, you, when you become a member of a renewable energy co-op, there's no way of linking your electricity usage to your um, investment or your, your membership in the co-op. And this has led to, um, I guess, in you know, an ideological challenge for the renewable energy or for the co-op regulator in Ontario, where you know, 50, where we have a rule which is 50% of your um, activity should be with members, and there's no way of linking membership with um, investment in a renewable energy co-op. Or there are, but it's very, very expensive, and we haven't gone that route. So that's just to set the stage um, for yes, yeah, so, of so what's happening. And you know, there's all kinds of challenges around them. If somebody's an investor and you don't have regular interaction with them, what does that mean as a member? Yes. Just to, to, to clarify the, the thing about 50 percent of members, you're talking about members of the worker co-op itself. Or? No. Um, so the renewable energy co-ops that I'm talking about are not worker co-ops. They are member-based co-ops. So they're producer co-ops. I like, yes, except that what you're producing cannot be traced back to the user. And so, in some ways, they become an investment co-op, which is sort of this new breed of co-op, uh, which the regulatory body is uncomfortable with because they're saying you're selling securities, you're not selling a product. So, you, you know, why are you a co-op? Um, I think everybody here is probably familiar with the value of co-ops and why we pursue this model. In the case of uh, electricity. For, you know, in the case of Trek and, and others in Ontario that are pursuing this model, one of the strong motivations for using the co-op model is that we want to get as many people involved in, in the co-op, and we see it as a form of education. Um, there is still a lot of um, resistance around renewable energy. People don't understand that it's, you know, what, that it is a legitimate form of electricity generation and that it's the future. And so we see uh, the co-op and, and the we, we deliberately keep the entry level low for members. So that for $1,000 or $500, you can participate and earn a return, and then you start to engage with this idea of, a, of renewable energy generation. And so that's uh, probably, um, I think that's a certainly unique uh, amongst uh, some of the talks that we're seeing evolve in, in Ontario is that, that, that entry level, even though there's higher transaction costs with each member, we think it's an important part of, of the service that we provide. Um, so a very quick uh, overview of uh, so the international context or specifically um, Germany and Denmark where renewable energy co-ops are, are sort of the predominant model for ownership. Um, so in Germany, first of all, they've got an incredible, they've had an incredible history of adding new renewable generation to the grid over the last 20 years. Um, 53,000 megawatts of uh, new generation since 2002, I believe, 
uh, or since 2000, and 50% of that is owned by individuals, um, either through the co-op model or they also use the limited liability partnership model in Germany, um, and it facilitates itself also to um, this sort of shared ownership. Uh, so $5 billion worth of community money invested, 200,000 Germans who are participating, and you can see that uh, there's been quite a significant increase in the amount of renewable energy generation that's been added to the German grid, and their projections are from 35% in the next, uh, well, eight years, I guess. Uh, and they are on track to meeting that. So, in some ways, you know, these numbers illustrate the potential that community power has, but it's you know, we really need the right framework. Um, just some numbers demonstrating that, uh, you know, compared to any other uh, owner, in private individuals and landowners are are by far the greatest. Uh, in this this graph would be, or this pie chart would be reversed. In a place like Ontario, you would have mostly the large energy providers, um, industry, and developers would be the predominant owners of renewable energy generation. Um, other countries that are are sort of strong in terms of individual or, or Local ownership, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, Denmark, Great Britain is, um, you know, starting to come up. There's a number of co-ops there um, that are developing, but still, compared to the corporate model, are not, uh, are still a strong minority. And Canada would certainly fall on the level of Spain here um, in terms of percentages. Uh, the history of renewable energy co-ops in Canada. Uh, so as I mentioned, the first project was connected to the grid in 2003. It's the Windshare Turbine and Expo Exhibition Place in downtown Toronto. Uh, there was a strong, really strong support for that project. Um, the, the folks at Trek, before I joined, managed to raise uh, three quarters of a million dollars in a couple of months. And they ended up with uh, another quarter of a million dollars in escrow waiting to be invested in a new project. And almost, very few people have actually withdrawn their money. Um, they basically said, hang on to it, we like what you're doing, we'll invest in the next project. And so some of those people are now invested in solar share. Um, as far as other, uh, so in Ontario then, there was there was attempts made to start other cooperatives uh, between 2003 and 2009, uh, but the policy framework, the price that was being paid for electricity was not sufficient in some groups to get their projects off the ground. And it wasn't until the Green Energy Act was introduced in 2009 that the right framework was created and, and principally was this introduction of the feed-in tariff program. Uh, there is a community feed-in tariff program in Nova Scotia that's uh, essentially stimulating community ownership there. It's, um, they've essentially set, up, set aside about 100 or identified 200 megawatts worth of capacity that community groups can access. Uh, to date, while there's been huge interest and uh, uptake in terms of applications and so far there aren't any cooperatives among that among those groups. So it's interesting to examine why that is the case and I'm not going to do that here but uh, we have colleagues in Nova Scotia who are sort of asking that question and certainly something we'll be pursuing. Um, in Quebec uh, there was a special call for proposals from community groups um, and they did have a number of co-ops that are under development but really only one that's been formed called Valio, um, and it's, it's really a collaborative of, of a number of different co-ops, um, and they are working together as a limited liability partnership. So not exactly the same framework, uh, but the interest is there. Uh, as far as the rest of Canada is concerned, well, Paul here was involved in the co-op in uh, Alberta, um, and there are a number of groups, but very few um, in each province. And the challenge is really the um, the lack of, a, of, an, of the ability to feed into the grid and have a mechanism where the co-op can be compensated for the power that is generated. I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards. Um, it just, you know, in summary, the barriers to community power, this is specific to Ontario, but relevant, I think, to a lot of other provinces as well. So the grid constraint and access to the grid is one of the big, big issues. Um, the electricity system is, is controlled by uh, monopoly institutions in many cases, and certainly centralized electricity um, institutions and so navigating that as a small community player is incredibly difficult. Um, it's, it's difficult even if you're you know a small commercial player 
um, that you know has been around for a while. Um, but if you're a you know a local group that's just starting out and you want to put even a small solar system on your rooftop, there's all kinds of channels that you have to go through. Um, and that leads to costly and cumbersome development processes. So A, there's a lot of time delays, there's a lot of legal documentation you need. You know, these are contractual arrangements and you know, these are 20-year relationships that we have both with the, with the landowner or the rooftop owner or the site owner, as well as the 20-year relationship with our members in terms of investment, you know, managing the money. Um, there's a lot of, there's a steep learning curve for, uh, for a lot of these groups. Um, you know, there's maybe one or two board members that have experience in the energy sector, um, you know, and sometimes not necessarily in developing a solar or a wind project, and so, you know, there's a lot of good intention, but sometimes, um, you know, not not actual on the ground experience. And so one of the challenges we have is figuring out how can we how can we make that development process easier? How can we achieve economy of scale as projects are coming up? How, what kind of systems can we create, for instance, to manage members um, so that we're all using like a centralized platform um, so we can we can a you know ensure that there's a there's a strong robust system that, that's being used to manage people's money but also to um, to ensure there's a you know a long term um, uh, relationship with sorry sorry you're stop <laughs> for me now. Stop. Um, to help the to help the co-op minimize its administrative costs that's ultimately the goal. Uh, and then the other big challenge is around financing. So even going to the co-op, uh, the credit unions right now is a non-starter. They do not really understand this model. They don't see a history. With your, a lot of these co-ops are new, so there's no, you know, there's no balance sheet to, to, to look at or you know, uh, income statements for the last five years or three years, which is sort of the minimum that often they're looking for. So there's a, there's a lot of learning, a lot of inventing and innovation that's happening within the sector. Um, which makes it exciting, but uh, also very tiring. And that's, <coughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, there's another session tomorrow about, specifically about uh, renewable energy co-ops. Uh, it's tomorrow afternoon at 2.45, I think. So um, I'll be talking specifically about solar share and that and the lessons learned. So uh, there'll be, uh, the, I'll be covering some of, the, some of the barriers there in more detail and talk about how we can overcome them. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much.